Hi, my name is Feline Hermans. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, and I'm going to talk about the science in computer science today. If you're on Twitter, you're using the hashtag, you can also mention me. This is my... Oh, this is the wrong clicker. <laughs> If you're on Twitter, you can mention me if you like my slides. Here's my Twitter handle so I can read later what you saw, what, uh, what you thought about my talk and I can read it. So science, you know, we all love science. This Facebook page has 13 million likes, so I, can, I think we can say that people like science. We like science like this. People actually study the grammar of dog and the grammar of lol cats. People did a master thesis on that, you know? That's the science we like. We can like that, we can share it on Twitter. Yay, I like science, click. But what is science? If you look at Wikipedia definition of science, it's, oops, it's a testable systematic system that makes predictions. So this is something we should be able to use if we're developers. We could use science to make predictions, testable predictions about our field. So a simple question like, what programming language is the best? Ah, that's, an, that's an easy question, right? We could just do some science, make a hypothesis, and get a testable prediction. <laughs> From the giggles in the room, I guess you know that this is not really the current state of science in computer science. You would expect something like this. Huh? A good debate, a proponent, an opponent, a polite discussion. But it's not really like that, it's more like this. <laughs> not even this, not really this. This is hacker news every day. People just shouting opinions about programming languages and tools and paradigms. Where is the science now, people? This is not just liking things on Facebook anymore. This is actually the state of the art, I would say, in making decisions about programming. We should do better. We are people, we consider ourselves technical people. Why, why do we put up with this? Why don't we make things more scientific? Well, that's what my talk is about. I'm going to show you a few examples of how science in software engineering can help you make better decisions based on actual data. So again, back to science. Back to what programming language is best. There are actually people out there who are trying to already improve the state of the art and try to understand what programming language is best. A very simple idea, just ask people. Ask people what programming language do you like and why do you like it? So there was, well, our researchers at Berkeley, they did that. They had people select a number of languages from a set so they could select up to seven languages, and then they got a few questions about their work with those languages, and they got 13,000 responses. So that's a pretty good set. You can draw some statistically valid conclusions from such a big set, probably. So, quiz. If you like this T-shirt, I have three more of them. We're actually the guys that made them outside. They have three more. So I have three questions in my talk. And people who get it right, the first one I hear yelling the right answer gets a t-shirt. So from this Berkeley study, what do you think is the most important factor for choosing a programming language? You already know. That's wrong. Syntax, also wrong. <laughs> Peer pressure, it's sort of similar to what you already know, but also wrong. Popularity. Popularity, wrong. Experience wrong. With the wrong. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. How easy it's to learn language. No, wrong, how easy it's to learn language. No, I'm going back with four t-shirts, people. <laughs> how the name sound? No. How the name sounds? No. Curiosity. No. What your team members know. This is very close. I'm going to say that that is the closest I heard so far. Let's just go to the answer. The first one is open so existing open source libraries for the language. And if you look at this list, extending existing code, using group familiarity, so you were somewhat on the right track with some of the answers. But what I think is most interesting about this graph is that the first aspect, actually having something to do with the language, is performance. 
And, and this is almost sixth place. And then if you look further, it's development speed and language features. So the things that we talk about all the time, like syntax, they're not so important. It's way more important what people know, what there is, and what open source libraries are. So we talk about syntax all the time, but it doesn't really, really matter. What feature of a language correlates with enjoyment the most? So we're not now talking anymore about what do I use at work, but what do I like the best? So this should, might be a little bit easier for you. Syntax. Syntax is close. It's a bit more specific than that. Ease of use. How fast, how fast do you see the results? How fast you see the results? Not really. Are you support? I would love that, but it's not. <laughs> no. It's related to syntax. Come on, those people, they really want to hand out the t-shirts. Verbosity. Verbosity. Well, expressiveness, which is, I would say, sort of the same thing. So expressiveness, or like, and a lack of verbosity actually correlates with programming enjoyment the most. This was also a result from the Berkeley study. So I would say again, this is interesting because the things we like, syntax related, but the things we, we use at work, we don't have the syntax related de decisions because other factors are more important there. So what about measuring the expressiveness? Uh, if, if an expressive language is a nicer language, what language is more expressive? Can we measure that actually? Is there a way to measure the expressiveness of a language? Well, there is a guy who tried this. He made a ranking of the expressiveness of different languages. And what he did for that is he looked at GitHub and he looked at commit sizes for different languages. So his assumption was that one commit is always the same amount of information. This is a little bit of a leap, but if you, of course, if you look at a lot of data, still interesting patterns may arise. So what he got was this. This is a box plot, and that means that the thick line is the median of the data, and the box is 25 and 75 percent, and then the line is 10 percent and 90 percent of all the data. So you can sort of see a trend. And here are all the languages that go with it. So all the way on the super verbose end is Fortran, not so surprising, JavaScript, C, Assembly, Visual Basic, and all the way at the other end, well, here we have some domain-specific languages like Puppet, CoffeeScript, very expressive, Clojure, and then, of course, Haskell. Uh, the, the functional languages are somewhat here in the middle. And the colors indicate the popularity of the languages. So the red ones are the most popular ones, and then come the blue ones, and then come the black ones. So here again, we sort of see that the things we like, expressiveness, are not the things we use because all the popular languages are at the verbose end of the spectrum. Interesting. And the, despite the fact that you might debate about it, is it really fair to compare commit size, I say that this is a fair representation. If you look at the data, it is in line with what you would expect. So I would say there's some credibility in this analysis. Another result from the Berkeley study, very interesting, is that developers don't really believe in static typing. If you look at these results, I see the value of static types. Only 36% thinks static typing is helpful. Compared to, for instance, 62% who see the value of unit testing. The most value of static types is in finding bugs. Only 8% agrees with this statement. So, static typing, rah, it's not so interesting, apparently, according to 13,000 developers. Is this actually true? Again, could we measure this? Is there a way to detect, to experiment in such a way that we can find out whether static typing is actually useless? So here's a guy, Stefan Hanenberg, and he tried to do this. He made up a set of experiments where he tried to understand the differences between static typing and dynamic typing. So what he did was he took a group of his students, university students, and he divided them into two groups. 
One group did the assignment with a static language, and the other group did the same assignment with a dynamic language. And then you can compare the two groups. You can say, hey, are they quicker? Are they better? Is there, is there really a difference? <coughs> of course, here again, you could debate about the experiment setup. It's a small group of students. They are students. They don't have the experience. It's not an industrial case. However, if we want to start somewhere, this is a good experiment to start with. So, let's make this debate again into a Star Wars themed discussion. On the left hand side we have the dynamic lover. He's gone through a few typecasts in his life and he really doesn't enjoy it anymore. He is in favor of dynamic typing. And on the other hand we have his op opponent who says no, no, static types are better. Let's see what this discussion fans out. Of course, this is argument number one. What are you going to say if you love dynamic languages? Yeah, but typecasting, it's so cumbersome. And you have to do dot to string, and you have to put things from an end. It's so cumbersome, it takes up time. Typecasting must hinder me and my productivity. No, it doesn't really matter. This is what Stefan Hanenberg found out in his experiments. For programs smaller than 10 lines of code, yes, Typecasting is hindering my productivity, but as soon as programs are longer than 10 lines of code, it doesn't matter anymore because it's very easy to do a typecast. The hard part of making a program is in thinking, so the typecasts don't contribute to a longer development time. Then people who love dynamic languages, of course, they say, yes, but I can fix type errors very quickly because in dynamic language everything goes quickly. Not even close. It's very untrue. What you see here in this graph, and again we have box plots, is the blue bar is groovy and the green bar is Java. And here you see that they're very compressed. So each set of points is one experiment. So you can see that the time for groovy is a lot longer in all the cases than the time that students needed to program the same solution in Java. And in many cases, the Places where in the dynamic solution the runtime errors occurred were the exact same positions where the people in the static language got the compile error, but they didn't have to go through compiling and running, so this saved them huge <coughs> amounts of time. So from this experiment, yeah, you can say static typing is at least quicker. He did a few follow-up experiments looking into API designs where he thought, well, a dynamic API must be easier because you don't have to think about the types. Again, you don't have to do typecasting. You just get in stuff and you will figure out what it is on the fly. Not true. Even if you document your dynamic API, it doesn't help you. Type names help more than documentation. So from this entire set of experiments, and he's been doing this for a few years and he's continuing to work on this, he would say, oh, yeah, even a better IDE doesn't help, specifically aimed at dynamic languages, won't help. So you could say, and he's a real scientist, you know, he says, it looks like Java-like static type systems really help in development. From these experiments, you can conclude that, which is so interesting. If you look at 30,000 developers saying, Bleh, doesn't really matter. And experiments show the opposite. So maybe static typing has a marketing problem. <laughs> so another very interesting question, design patterns. You know, we love them. We have stacks of books on our desk about using the right design patterns. But do they really work? And, and why do they work? So here's another scientist, Walter Titchy, and he worked on this. He tried to understand in a very similar fashion that Stefan Hanenberg does with static versus dynamic, do design patterns help? So also he divided a group of students into two separate groups and one group got problems to solve maintenance problems with design patterns and the other group without design patterns. Well, actually, the setup was a little bit different. Here you can see the experimental setup. So these are the, the circles are the programs with documentation for patterns, and these are the programs without documentations. His first experiment, he said, let's just take the same solution, but we give, to, we, give we make pro, uh, programs 
with documentation about the patterns. So we say, here's a program, and here's the pattern that it implements. And we, gi we give the same program to students, but then without the documentation. So still the same patterns, but no documentation. And of course you can do this on the same problem, because if I look at code and I, they tell me there's a design pattern in it, I can't look at the same code again and forget there's a design pattern. So we made pairs where you have one program with a design pattern and then one without a different program. But if you use such a four group setup, you can compare these two with these two. And then you can see, does the design documentation help. So what he found was, yes, just only knowing that the pattern is there already helps you doing maintenance assignments. So in the group with pattern documentation, there were 15 correct solutions. And in the group without pattern documentation, there was only seven. The time didn't really matter, but that was because in his first experiment, he considered all solutions, also incorrect ones. And that's of course not entirely fair, because if I'm in the wrong path, it might take me forever to solve it, because I don't understand it, I don't know how to do it. So he said, well, if we look only at the best solutions, then there was a small time difference. So he tried this setup, and I thought, okay, let's try this setup in practice. Let's try this with practitioners. He actually went to a conference, much like I'm here today, and he said, hey, I want to do an experiment. Who's with me? And then people, practitioners, participated in a very similar experiment. But here, it wasn't just a version with and without documentation. It was actually the same code, but with and without different design patterns. So there was a pretest, very similar to what he did with the students just without any explanation about design patterns, because there are many people who don't even know design patterns, or they don't know all of them. Then there was a course in the middle, and then he repeated the same test with and without design patterns. So you can also see if the education, the explanation of design patterns work. So here are some of the results. For the decorator pattern, you can easily see that both pre-test and post-test with a design pattern, so that's this one and that one. It takes people that do the assignment less time if you have code base with design patterns. And the, the course in this case didn't even matter. Apparently the decorator par pattern is so easy or intuitive, they didn't even need the course, it was already quicker. That was not the case for the observer pattern. So here you see, before they had the patterns course, it took more time with the design pattern. However, after the course, it took less time the code with the design pattern. So an interesting lesson here is it does help, however, only if you know the design patterns. And if you don't know them, it might actually worsen your case. So if you, if you have new people coming on in your team from a different language, maybe just out of school, from a different domain, it might actually hurt to throw them in a code base that's perfectly designed, only design patterns, if they are not aware of these design patterns. So an interesting question is, why do design patterns work? Because it's interesting to know that they work, but why do they work? And we can easily, more easily understand this if we look at another set of experiments that were done in the 70s. And this was not about developers, it was about jazz players. A group of psychologists did some experiments on very, very good chess players. They gave them a chess board with a chess setup, and they only got to look at it for a few seconds, and then they took the chess board away. And turned out the chess players could, from memory, recreate all the boards without any effort. Super easy. So the conclusion that these psychologists drew was, ha, chess players have good memory. That's it. And it's easy. Oh, publication, that's good. But it wasn't that easy. So this experiment was replicated in the 90s, but now they didn't use chess setups, but they also used random setups. So just a board with random pieces, not a chess situation, even a, a situation that could never occur in a game. So now what was the result? Chess players really sucked. They were just as bad as normal people they would grab off the street. 
So it wasn't the case that chess players have a better memory, and this is why they are chess players. What was the case? They are trained to recognize setups. They know, hey, this is the situation. They don't remember there's a rook on a5 and a, and a queen on b4 or something. No, what they memorize is, hey, this is the setup, and then he did these moves, and that area is in danger, and there's somewhere uh, a horse there. So they don't memorize all the pieces. What they memorize is patterns on the board that they have been trained to memorize. And this is exactly the same reason why design patterns work. Because the way the human brain works is there is long-term memory, much like a hard drive, and short-time memory, much like memory in a computer. If you want to store things in your long-time memory, it takes a longer time to get it out. And then you have short-time memory, which is super quick, but it has a limited amount of spaces. People argue between four and seven things you can have in your short-time memory at the same time. So if you look at the code base and you can memorize, hey, that's an observer pattern, it only takes you one short-term memory space. If you have to memorize, hey, there's this class, and if something happens, then that class gets notified, then you have to keep all those different things in memory. And then your short-term memory is full, you go to long-term memory, memory, and that's slower. So this is the exact same way design patterns and the chess players manage to memorize the structure of their code base because they use patterns and they only use one space of short-term memory. So the experiments help us to un help us to understand why it how it works. But then, if you look into cognitive science and other ex similar experiments that have been done, that can also help you to understand why things work. Which is interesting, of course, because if you only know that it works, there's no way of tweaking it, improving upon it, and really elaborating a phenomenon. Another interesting case. Does Linus's law hold? And maybe you know Linus's law. This is the law that says, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Oh, there's a guy here, he knows it from memory. That's what Linus says. Well, is this really true? Well, not everyone thinks it's true. This made the rounds on the internet a while back. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, right? It's very true. It has like 5,000 retweets. So this is sort of the, the, a contradiction with Linus's law. It says that you know you will be only find shallow things and not uh, the difficult bugs. Okay, well you might not be impressed by me <laughs> using tweets as science, but I have some scientific evidence of the opposite of Linus's law as well. Because there's a beautiful piece of source code. It's called Windows Vista. <laughs> you remember it? It's fantastic. I love it. Because it's full of bugs and we can research all those bugs. So there were a few researchers actually at Microsoft Research and they looked into how organizational structure, how who looks at the code, actually affects the number of bugs. And what they found is that the more people that touch a method or a class, the more bugs it contains. That's cool, right? So the more people work on a certain piece of code, the more bugs it has. And it gets more interesting than that. Not only is organizational structure, so the way your organization uses code, not only is it a good predictor of code quality, it's the best predictor. So the best way to predict where bugs in your system occur is not code complexity, it's not churn, no code metric at all. The best way to predict where there will be bugs in your source code is not to look at the source code, but to look at your organization and who is collaborating with who. This is a chart from the paper that Microsoft researchers wrote about Microsoft Vista. And organizational structure turns out to be the best predictor so they, they make the best prediction and they have the fewest mistakes, better than any other code-related metric. That's, I, I think that's so interesting that from looking at your organization, you can learn whether or not your code is good. And this also gives credibility 
to the idea that you should really look into how your team is organized, is, is organized, who works with who, because otherwise, well, your code will just suck, basically. <laughs> So, final case I'm going to present today, and this is my own research. So, all the researches I showed you so far weren't done by me. They were done by other researchers in the world, similar researchers doing similar stuff. But this is my own field of research. My central, qu the question I tried to answer with my research is, are spreadsheets code? Can you regard an Excel spreadsheet as a piece of programming? So, first of all, I say yes, because spreadsheets are used for very, very similar problems. The problem you have here, it's an investment calculation. You put in some input, you get out some output. You could do that in any language. You could do it in JavaScript or in C Sharp or in VB, whatever you like. Or you could do it in a spreadsheet. It's a really similar problem that you could use a spreadsheet for. You could, of course, argue why, why do you do that in a spreadsheet? Well, I've asked this, of course, to people. I asked them, why are you building a spreadsheet? Why don't you just go to IT and have them make this investment model for you? Well, sometimes we can be a little bit disappointing, I'm told. They say, oh, well, we tried that. We went to the IT once, and they said, yeah, sure, we can build that. It will take six months and one million euros. <laughs> and then <laughs> that wasn't the worst part, because in the end, it took 12 months, and it was five million euros. <laughs> so they're like, I can do that better. I can make a spreadsheet. I can do it in one hour. So I don't need those pizza eating, Pepsi drinking IT peoples anymore. I can do it myself. So this is the reason that some solutions are implemented in a spreadsheet and not in another programming language. So I go to great lengths to make my point. I actually go to such great lengths that I implemented this Turing machine in spreadsheets. <laughs> using only formulas, so no VB, only formulas. And with that, I proved that spreadsheet formulas are actually Turing complete. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go, on, go ahead, thank you. <laughs> You're not the only one who liked it. It was made the news, if actually, if you Google Excel Turing machine, you will find many blogs that also applauded my effort in making a Turing machine in the spreadsheet. And in addition to being the proof that formulas are Turing complete, I also think it's a very nice visualization of what a Turing machine is. So one row is one iteration of the lint, and then the next one is the next, and with conditional formatting, I visualize how the head moves over the lint. I think it's, it's beauty. But moving on to my point, the third reason why spreadsheets should absolutely be considered code is they suffer from typical software engineering problems. Only one in three spreadsheets have a manual. An average spreadsheet is used by 12 different people and has an average lifespan of five years. Sounds familiar? It's just like source code. It's the exact same problem. So you can conclude, and this is my conclusion as well, that spreadsheets are code. I go all around the world to spread the happy word, spreadsheets are code. This is my life's gospel. So, of course, if spreadsheets are code, hey, that's interesting because we know a thing or two about code. All the research I showed you before, all the experience we have from working with source code, we can apply that to spreadsheets if they are code. And this is exactly what I did. Yes, we can apply software engineering methods to spreadsheets. This is the main thesis of my PhD dissertation, that this is very much possible. So, therefore, we build a refactoring tool for spreadsheets. It's called Bumblebee, and it helps users, end users, normal spreadsheet users, to refactor their spreadsheet. This is how it looks like. A spreadsheet with a formula that's, well, you could say suboptimal. We say smelly. It has a code smell, a spreadsheet smell. Because you could use a built-in function here. You use the sum divided by the count, but of course you could use an average, which is shorter and easier and re more reusable. So with our plugin, you can actually say, hey, give me the applicable rewrites. We don't say refactorings, we say rewrites. And then the tool says, hey, yes, I can do that. I can make an average out of that. And then users can say, okay, I want that. And then, hop, we refactor the spreadsheet for them. And these trans <laughs> thank you. And these transformations, they are entirely programmable in a little language you see here. So here, users can define, this says any formula can be 
refactor it into rounding the formula, or here you have the summing count to average. And we think we're still experimenting with this tool, but we think that power users who can write macros, who can use VB, they should also be able to implement these transformations. And then you can also use them in a broader sense than refactoring. You could also use them to change a business rule over a number of spreadsheets if you implement them within a company. Final chance for a t-shirt, guys. I know it's late, so I have to keep you with me. This one is going to be so easy. If you say refactoring, you say testing. testing. Yeah, I heard it here the first time. Come get me later for a t-shirt. Of course, if you say refactoring, you say testing. So this is what we thought with Excel users as well. If they are refactoring, then maybe we can get them to test as well. And in the beginning we thought, oh, this is going to be difficult because it's already difficult to get professional developers to test. Not all of them see the benefits of unit testing. It's getting a little bit better, but it's still hard to get them to do it. So it will be even harder to get those end users, those non-developers, to test. That wasn't true at all. We were really looking the wrong way. I made the mistake, the typical researcher mistake, of sitting in the university and thinking about reality instead of going out in reality and see what was there. Because when we started to look at spreadsheets, we saw that these patterns, things like this, were really common. You could say this is a test. If the sum of these guys is not 100, then I will write error, and also I will, else I will write 100%. You could say that's a test or an assertion. At the least, these guys have to sum up to 100, otherwise, error. So we thought, hey, we can exploit those type of tests that are already in people's spreadsheets. We can extract them and present them to users in a different way. So this is exactly what we did. We built a tool that detects those test formulas. And by looking at the heuristically, the words error and OK, and even we saw smiley faces and saddy faces for breaking tests actually encountered in real life spreadsheets. We can even guess what's the passing and the failing outcome of a test. And if users say, yes, that is indeed a test, they can save it in our system and we can then continuously show to them if they're breaking formulas by making passing formulas green and not tested formulas red. And you can use the dependency graph of spreadsheets here because I say, okay, this cell is tested and this cell refers to these cells. So we could say, okay, let's, let's consider them tested as well because if you do something wrong here, you will get an error somewhere else. And in a similar fashion, we could say, hey, these are not tested yet. So in that way, we help users to understand what they have tested and what they haven't tested yet. And it doesn't matter if they use error in the one sheet and OK in the other sheet. We can grab all the tests together and present a test suite, if you will, to them that helps them understand the robustness of their spreadsheets. So that's it. There's plenty of time for questions. But before we go to questions, I will summarize my entire talk again in about one minute. So if you came in later, or if you have been sleeping, or just thinking about beers, this is your second chance to get my talk in only one minute of effort. And if you have been paying attention, this is, of course, optimal preparation for question asking. So this is the current state of discussions in computer science. People yelling opinions without really having any data. That's not scientific. That's not science. It's not testable, not reproducible. It doesn't bring us any further to just debate. Simple questions like what programming language is best can be solved using science. You could interview people. People did that, and it turns out that syntax isn't as important for choices in programming languages as you might think. Expressiveness really correlates with enjoyment. You can measure expressiveness. You can see what languages are more expressive than others over a large set of programs. And you can measure static and dynamic typing, the influence, if you look at who does best with what language. There are people who try that. They did the same with design patterns. Are design patterns actually helping? Most of the times they are, but they can be hurtful as well if people don't understand them. Linus's law sounds nice, but it's actually not very true. The more people that use a s work on a class, the more bugs it tends to contain. 
Final question, are spreadsheets code? My answer is yes. And because of that, you can apply computer science, software engineering methods to spreadsheets with very good results. That was my talk. If you like these slides, they are on SlideShare with a narrative, something like that, where I explain it. It also has all the links to all the research papers and all the studies I showed. I'm here tonight. I'm going to bowl. So if you like to talk science with me tonight, then join me at the bowling. You could also send me a tweet if you want to chat tomorrow. I'll be here tomorrow as well. Or have a look at my website. If I go to software engineering conferences, science conferences, I usually live blog what I see there. So if you want to keep up with modern software engineering research, you can have a look at my blog and stay tuned. Time for questions. <laughs> Just uh, a clarification. You, you said more touches implicates more bugs. Uh, how do we know that it's actually a causal relationship? Uh, isn't it that buggy classes are touched by most people? Yeah, that's of course a very good question. So more specifically, I should say there is a correlation between classes that are touched. Of course, it is true that if a class is buggy, then more people might work on it. But then, how did it get buggy? So it's very hard to detect. You could, I don't think the researchers in this study did that, but of course you could look at when the bugs are introduced. If you have a bug tracking system, then you can see when people started reporting bugs. But it remains to be uh, unclear. But at least the correlation is interesting. Very, you're very right. Uh, another uh, thing that popped up into my mind while you were talking about Bumblebee and testing for spreadsheet, uh, aren't you covering up an actual problem? That is that the IT guys asked for five million uh, <laughs> with this approach. I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's really interesting, but I'm wondering if it's... Uh, if there is an underlying problem on the other side. Yeah, right. so it's a very good question. Aren't you, I get this question a lot. Aren't M and I solving a problem that other people should solve? We should solve it with better software or maybe better solutions for end users than spreadsheets. Many people have tried that. In both directions, there's a lot of work that has tried to uh, make software cheaper and easier, but that still remains a channel challenge, and also people have tried to come up with better end-user tools for spreadsheets than spreadsheets, for end-users than spreadsheets. But my take on this as a researcher is there is a problem. And this problem is, I didn't mention that, but there's a fantastic organization called the European Spreadsheet Risk Interest Group. <laughs> <laughs> they have a website, usepick.org, go there. They have a list of horror stories. So stories of companies and organizations that lost a lot of money because of spreadsheet. And at least I could go through midnight, go through that list. I will put it on my blog as well, a link. And there are so many big mistakes in spreadsheet. I will give you one example just because I love it so much. Is the Olympics in London two years ago. So you expect the Olympics, they have a budget of a gazillion euro pounds, I don't know. So you expect that they have, you know, a very sophisticated ticketing system. And they don't. They use the spreadsheet to send out tickets. I kid you not. And it was a mistake in one of those spreadsheets and they overbooked one of their stadiums by 10,000 tickets. <laughs> Seriously. Of course, not really money loss. I mean, there are companies in the horror stories that lost more money, but this is really Ill illustrative of the fact that they can't claim legacy. They are a new organization. They're only a few years old, and yet they use a spreadsheet. So my take on this is this is a problem. Companies and organizations are struggling with this problem. And so far, my research has caught on. People like to use these tools. They like to make their spreadsheets better. Many end users really want to build a good spreadsheet. They don't, no one sets out to bike to their work on Monday thinking, so I'm going to make a company critical spreadsheet today full of bugs. No, of course not. They want to make it better. And I just provide the tools for them to make it better. <laughs> <laughs>